Okay, welcome to Biz Sugar Live. Today we are really fortunate to have with us successful e-commerce business owner and strategy advisor to many, John Lawson III. John is the best-selling author of Kick-Ass Social Commerce for Epreneurs and the CEO of Colder Ice Media, a consulting agency for online sellers. His agency assists small businesses with everything required to maximize their profits, including advising on content creation, marketing, and online sales strategies. John doesn't just teach, he also runs his own e-commerce business, The Shoestring King, and that business has made him a platinum eBay power seller, top-rated Amazon merchant, the facilitator of over half a million transactions online, and a three-time Amazon number one best-selling book author. He also founded the 8,000-plus member international community, The E-Commerce Group, on Facebook. Members there share how to make take your sales from just one platform to many. So we're going to welcome John and let him take it away. Hey guys! All right, so it's going to be intimate and fun. Um, I probably won't be able to see your questions um, until I come back over, but feel free to ask them because I think it's going to have like a full screen on my side, so I won't be seeing the chatter. But when I come back for Q and A, I'll delve as deep as you want to on any of the subject matter that we cover or any subject matter that we didn't cover that you have questions about. All right. So let's jump right in. I'm going to share my screen with you guys with the presentation for today. Um, and yeah, it does actually cover over. It does, doesn't it? I'm going to go back and see. Yeah, it says I'm speaking. So I guess I kind of, you know, fly back over if there's anything in the Q&A. Make sure you just answer or ask any questions you have over there. All right. So let's get started. Kick-ass e-commerce is what we're going to deal with. I like asking people this question. How many of you are Amazon Prime members? If you're an Amazon Prime member, just say yes over in the chat. I'm going to just look and see if anybody uh was able to say that just if you if you are a amazon prime member let me know and here's the reason why we got one no and, and then we got one yes which would be me because i am an amazon prime member so i'll admit to it right but the deal is i just i'm here in las vegas today uh, yesterday, I spoke at ASD, which is one of the big trade shows uh, that meet here in Vegas, about 22,000 uh, attendees there. And I asked the question, how many of you are prime members? And probably 85% of the room stood up and said, yes, we're prime members. And then I had them sit down as I asked different questions. The last question uh, qualification was, how many of you ordered something from Amazon in the last week? And half the room was still standing. And that is a testimony to what I really believe is the gorilla in the room. No matter when you talk about e-commerce, at least in the United States, you know, uh, there's a global footprint that Amazon does have, but it's, base in the United States is massive. And there are right now over 150 million Amazon Prime subscribers in the United States, 150 million. The census just came out and the numbers were very telling. The numbers are that we have about 334 million people in the United States, 150 million of them are Amazon Prime members. What does that mean? I mean, that really means that Amazon is actually training the e-commerce audience. Their, their experience and their reach and their breadth is really uh, um, training people on what to expect when they are uh, buying something from an e-commerce store or an e-commerce transaction. 
And that's what we have to recognize throughout everything I teach today. Um, there, there is that gorilla in the room of Amazon. Amazon is a $1.64 trillion company. $1.64 trillion. And you know, we throw out the word uh, million, billion, trillion. And I don't think we have a real good grasp on how much a trillion dollars actually is. So this is an image of a trillion dollars. And those little squares you see, those are representative of a pallet of hundred dollar bills. So that's a pallet that is four feet high. <clears throat> it's four by four by four, all right? Four feet high four feet wide, four feet in length. And that is, if you stack those on top of each other, that's what a trillion dollars looks like. And Amazon is 1.64 trillion, right? Now think about this too. Uh, we know Walmart is a beast when it comes to retail, right? And this chart you're looking at is the first 17 years of growth of Amazon versus 17 years of growth uh, in Walmart. Walmart started in 1968, Amazon starting in 1996. But look at the trajectory of growth of the two when you put them side by side. So it really it shows you how massive Amazon and its power has become. Amazon, 1.64 trillion, Walmart, 400 billion, huge company. Walmart's a huge company. So let's add the next biggest company in retail on top of that. That would be Costco. That third one, let's add that. That would be CVS. And then just for fun, let's add the fourth and fifth ones in here. And then you got Target and Best Buy. And you can see that Amazon's footprint is twice the size of its next five competitors combined. Yeah, insane, insane. All right, so who, who's this guy? You're probably like, why are we listening to him about e-commerce and what uh, are some of his credentials? All right, cool, I'll give you some credentials. These are my credentials. Yes, I've done this for nearly 20 years now. Uh, I'll be celebrating 20 years in October of this year, no, December of this year, uh, doing e-commerce. Uh, I spent a lot of time learning what I've learned because I did a lot of things right. And that's how I got to where I am today because I did a lot of things right. But more importantly, I did a whole lot of things wrong, right? I did uh, probably 80% of the things I've done I've, were wrong. 20% worked. Right, it's the 80-20 rule. The 20% is paying for all of the other mistakes that I did in my business. But the cool thing is the things that I discovered, I discovered it the hard way. And just by you guys being here today and listening to this presentation or listening to the recording, you're gonna get a cheat and you get to learn the easy way. And just to give you a little bit of backstory, I was working at a uh, a consulting job. I worked uh, in IT consulting and a friend of mine came to me and was like, hey, we should flip a house. I know I can get this house and we can flip it and we could probably, we're going to make $10,000 a piece. We'll make 20,000 or more on the flip. I'm like, okay, sure. I'm in, you know, I signed the paperwork to uh, get the financing because I got the good job. I've got the credit. So, um, I do that part. His part is the hustle part. He's getting the contractor together. He's going to make sure that the house is in uh, the best order so that when we flip this house, we can make that money back. So we ended up dressing up the house. This uh, rundown property, we actually uh, made it into a very cute and attractive property. Um, the one thing, though, is that this property was on the corner of Joseph E. Lowry and Martin Luther King Jr. Drive here in, in Atlanta. And that's where I'm uh, based out of. Yes, I'm in Vegas today, but 
I, I live in Atlanta. So uh, the house was on the corner of these two iconic uh, uh, black civil rights uh, 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 leaders. The crazy thing is, and I just, you know, this is just to give you guys some insight. And like I said, you, you, you could learn some things from me. Uh, one thing I want you to learn, and if you find yourself, uh, you know, on the corner of two black leaders streets, you know, and uh, you don't know where you are, you probably just want to run. You know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily going to be put in the best neighborhood. And our house was not in the best neighborhood. So these images you see are actually images after we had rehabbed the house. They had went into the home and ripped out the HVAC systems. They ripped out the, the second picture here on the right is the kitchen. They actually ripped out all the walls to get to the copper piping. And uh, we ended up with a substantial loss on that property. I went walking through one day and I could not believe what had happened to that lovely little place that we had put together. And I was working, uh, this is early 2000s, I was making about 50,000 a year, and I was not prepared to have a second mortgage that I was going to have to float for who knows how long after I paid back the money that we had put back into that house. It was just, you know, overwhelming. I was feeling completely overwhelmed. And if you ever had this feeling where you are about to drown and you feel like you just are not going to get enough water, it's at the, you know, uh, uh, nose line and your mouth's already under and you've got weight on your shoulders. That's the way I was feeling. I was feeling like this guy, I think I'm going to drown. And a friend of mine came to me and um, said, you know, hey man, you could probably uh, do some uh, online selling. And I remember one day I came out of my house and the car had been repossessed. You ever had a car repossessed? I mean, it's the best way to get on your feet, you know, <laughs> is to miss a car payment, have them come and take your car. So, I mean, all things now are on red light. And so my buddy told me, he's like, you know, you can make some extra money by selling stuff on eBay. And I was like, eBay, really? He's like, yeah, 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 you can sell anything. And so I started selling my IT books. Since I was in IT, you know, they had these big, thick books that would teach you how to code. That's how I got started in e-commerce, was selling those books. And I literally sold out all of my books. And after that, I started my trek on finding product and uh, turning what was a negative into a positive. So much, in fact, that three years later, from that date when I started selling used books on eBay, I left my primary job and never looked back. It was on from there. And like I said, 20 years later, here we are. All right. So that's who this guy is. And what's going on right now? I mean, the world got different. Everything that you remember prior to, you know, uh, uh, February or so of 2020, is completely changed. I'm out in the world right now and everything's different. It's just, you know, it happened in an instant, but understand that this is not the first time. Yes, for us in recent memory, it's the first time for, you know, uh, the 100 year um, uh, pandemic. Yes, that's different. But when it comes to disruption, you know, Understand that some of our greatest companies in the United States were actually started during very troubled economic times. Look at some of these uh, staples. I like, you know, IBM and GE and General Motors, HP, Sports Illustrated, MTV, you know, all of these were started during troubled economic times here in the United States. And during the last the uh, 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 great recession, you know, of the 2008 to 2012 or so, 
You know, look at these companies that are staples today, but were started in troubled economic times. I mean, where would you be right now without your, you know, some of these apps as a business owner? I'm sure you use several of these, um, you know, but if not, you've seen the growth of them. And they were all st started during our last recession. So the only thing that, that is actually permanent in business and in life is change. Everything is changing. There, there's nothing that's not changing. I'm sitting at a desk on a chair. And honestly, you can't see the module, the model molecules that make up this hardwood desk that I have in front of me. I can't see that. I think this desk is solid, but it's not solid. It's just actually moving at such a slow rate. The molecules in it are moving at such a slow rate that it feels like it's solid, but it's not solid. It will change and it's changing right now every day. If you come back to this desk in 500 years, it will not be what it is today because it's changing. The chair you're sitting on will change, right? So everything is in constant, permanent change. And when change comes in business and uh, in economics, money does not dry up. It's not like all of a sudden the millions of dollars that are in an industry just dry up. Money doesn't dry up. What money does is it moves. It moves from one industry to another. All the money and the valuation that was in Uber came from somewhere, right? It came from the money in the taxi business. So all that money that people were spending there, they moved that money over into the Uber uh, uh, economy, right? How about Airbnb? Huge, huge company. That money came from where? Traditional uh, uh, hotels and that money was moved into the Airbnb, Airbnb. In our industry, Sears, I mean, when I was a kid, Sears was Amazon, right? Sears was everything. You go to Sears, you'd buy your appliances, you'd buy your clothes, you would see the eye doctor at Sears, you would get your keys made at Sears, you'd get your tires changed at Sears. Sears was everything. Today, I don't think that there's a Sears in existence, at least not in my neighborhoods. They're all gone. Where did that money go? It didn't dry up. That is what's fueling this beast we call Amazon. So here we go uh, in terms of this chart right here. I want to just kind of share what, what's going on in e-commerce right now. Now, Last year, 2020, we saw a 25 plus percent growth of uh, uh, e-commerce sales. And prior to that, the years prior, we would see these double digit growth in e-commerce. I, I think, and based on this chart, um, uh, we're seeing that probably in 2020, it won't be the same that it was the massive growth we saw in 20. Uh, I'm sorry, in 2021 and 2020, we won't see that same massive growth, but the growth will continue. And as uh, this double digit growth all the way out, it's saying to, you know, projecting out until 2025 when uh, we will, or 2024, we'll stop seeing double digit growth. Maybe, I don't know if this is actually going to be the uh, the case or the scenario because of all the things that are surrounding how you know our behaviors are changing. But no matter what, the percentage of retail that is moving online is massive, and it's continuous. It's definitely going to continue to grow throughout the next five years, and probably even extending on that. E-commerce in terms of total retail sales is a good play. You have to be in here. So why do people shop online? Well, we asked the people and the people responded. So uh, 
nearly 60% of people shop online because simply they could do it 24 seven. It's available to them anytime they want. They like the ability to compare prices so that they can feel as though they are getting the best price or the best, you know, uh, 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 bang for their buck. And the number three reason is because they think online sales are better prices. Now, that doesn't always happen to be the case, but they think that it is, and that's why they will come to online to uh, compare prices and do their shopping. Other uh, reasons is to save time, convenience, uh, more variety and selection, free shipping. That's that's huge. That free shipping makes that list because if you're not dealing with free shipping, remember what we said at the beginning about how Amazon is training the e-commerce customer and the consumer. Free shipping is something you've got to figure out how to offer. Now, I know that there's no such thing as free shipping because I went to the post office, asked them about the free shipping, and, and you know, they were like, you know, there's no such thing as free shipping. I get it. We understand understand there's no such thing as free shipping, but there's no such thing as free packaging either. You don't make packaging a line item for your products, right? So the, the uh, call out of shipping for the product price is getting a little uh, antiquated. And the new consumer likes the idea of knowing the price is the price that they're going to pay and shipping is not an add on. So if you can figure out free shipping, if you haven't figured out free shipping, you need to work on it. If nothing else, just getting the offer where you're having shipping uh, over a certain amount of orders, right? So if you can tease out, how do you come to this determination is what you wanna do is you wanna look at your average order value. What is the average cart value for any order? Let's say the average cart value for our orders are $20. People come, they order on average $20 from us. Well, you want to put a premium of about 15 to 20% over what your average is, and then that becomes your free shipping offer, right? So if I'm at $20, another 20% would be, uh, what was that, $2? No, $4, right? So I could say, in uh, all to to really make this enticing is to say, since they're averaging 20, if I could get them to buy 25, I'll give them free shipping. See? So now you're you what you're doing is you're you're enticing people to spend five dollars more with you, and if they do, you will give them free shipping. And you normally, you know, for even for a guy like me, you know, what we sell, I know that the, the, the most costly part of doing business is when people order one product. If they would just order a second product, when it comes to shipping, I can ship that second product for darn near nothing because all of the costs that are associated with shopping with us really comes from that first product, putting that first product in the envelope costs more, way more, you know, 100 times more than if I just double up that order. So you want to entice people to double up that order to increase your profits, and then you are able to offer them free shipping. What they love, they get. What you need, you get. All right, so that's why people shop online. And let's go into the e-commerce business models. There's three e-commerce business models for, uh, that are really options for you. Self-hosted, cloud-based, and marketplaces. And we're gonna delve a little bit deeper in what those are. So let's just start with the self-hosted ones. Um, you're pretty familiar with WooCommerce and Presto Shop, Magento. Those are self-hosted solutions, right? And believe it or not, no, I mean, you know, Shopify, is doing some amazing things in this space. But Shopify is not the number one e-commerce platform. Actually, WooCommerce is the number one e-commerce platform. One in four stores online are WooCommerce stores. So uh, WooCommerce is a self-hosted 
um, uh, store solution, you can get that with using WordPress and it's a WordPress plugin and it's all free. This is all free. The only thing you pay for is the hosting. That's why it's called self-hosted, right? So it's open source uh, a software that you host on your own servers, whether that be here in your, if you have something inside your uh, organization physically or in the cloud. So those are self-hosted options, okay? Um, what are some of the pros and cons of self-hosted? Of self -hosted? Well, the pros are, like I said, it's free, it's scalable, it's flexible, it's open source, and it's very powerful. You can customize and make this store look and work pretty much exactly how you want it to. You can create the uh, environment that you absolutely, if you can think it, dream it, you can create it with self-hosted solutions. And the thing is, you own everything. So you have total you know, autonomy on the rules and the regulations and how you want things set up. That pretty much, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's certain things you can't do just in general, just on the internet in general, you know, you can't run different schemes or things like that. But I'm saying just as it comes to the e-commerce portion and creating a store, you know, you own that and it's your domain. You know what I'm saying? Now, what are the cons? The cons, the cons. <laughs> what are the cons? The cons are, hey, you own it. <laughs> you built it. You own it. So you got to maintain it. And, and if there's any security changes or any policy changes, you are the go-to to make sure that it gets handled. So all the maintenance is on you. It may cost you a lot to set it up or it may cost you a lot to you know, make changes and maintain it because you might need to keep people on staff. You know, if you have an outage, you have to get that taken care of quickly. So you might need a whole tech team to work with uh, to, to maintain your self-hosted solution, all right? So that's the cons. Not overwhelmingly, I don't wanna, uh, 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 I'm just laying it out for you, right? Uh, like I said, a quarter of one in four stores are self-hosted. So it's not like it's not doable. It's not like there's services out there that will, will help aid and assist you. I just want you to know what you're looking at if you're comparing apples to oranges, all right? The second is cloud-based. Cloud-based stores are things like Shopify, Big Commerce, GoDaddy has a solution. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of another one, but you, you guys get it. There's, there's all kinds of, you know, uh, cloud-based options for you to build an e-commerce uh, store. The pros of this, there's no hosting that you have to do on your own. It doesn't require you to install anything and the upgrades are sent and applied automatically. So you don't have to worry about that kind of maintenance. The security risk is very low because they take care of the platform. It's their platform. They're responsible for all the security protocols. So that's again, something you do not have to worry about. There's got a lot of templates uh, and features that are built in that'll help you get started up and running very quickly. And it's easy to scale and integrate with uh, most solutions, right? I'm sure there's some that work, you know, like with big commerce that don't work with Shopify, but most of the, the solutions, third-party solutions work with both platforms or all of these platforms in the cloud, all right? The cons, you do not own your store, all right? That you don't own it. You're renting your space. Um, you're going to pay a rental fee every month, you know, and and so that's one of the cons. The other one is in order for them to maintain the uh, uh, installations and the hosting and upgrades and all that stuff, they have to limit the amount of customizations that you can do to a store. So you're going to have some constraints with what you want to do. So when you're like, hey, I want to put this button up here on the right, eh, you're not going to be able to necessarily do that depending on uh, you know, how much you know what you're doing. You're going to have to kind of use a templated experience, all right? It's higher cost 
because usually you, you get all this stuff all inclusive. So you're going to pay a monthly fee. So that's a, a, a slightly higher cost. Um, and the last part is if there is an outage or something like that, you are depending on their support team to uh, work with you or to get that stuff set up. I mean, if Shopify servers go down, your store goes down. Nothing you can do about that. You're going to be sitting around waiting on Shopify to send you a notification that their servers are back up. There's just nothing you can do. That's, I mean, you know, it's a reality. Again, is it happening all the time? Probably not, you know, but I just want you to understand some of the cons that are uh, go along with that. All right. Just check in, see if we got any questions. Um, okay, cool. I see Sean's asked a couple questions. Let's see. Uh, how much increase in sales of groceries and home deliveries of food products? Um, that's that's a good question. Uh, the, the breakout that we were looking at for that chart, it, it does have food and grocery there, but I don't have the breakout, you know, of uh, grocery and home delivery. We know that um, Amazon in uh, second quarter of last year had so much influx in the grocery and home delivery that they had to basically turn off third party shipping so that they could meet the needs and demands. They've built an amazing infrastructure and hired half a million people in 2020 to maintain their, their network of delivery. So there's not a hard, fast number that I've seen that I can put with you, but I could probably look it up. I mean, but um, it's 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 massive. I, I think I remember, actually, I think I remember at one point, 30% increase overnight for groceries for by delivery. 30% increase overnight, literally in their industry in uh, grocery delivery. All right. When starting out as an e-commerce entrepreneur, are better off using an existing platform like eBay or Amazon or building their own store from the beginning. Uh, I think I'll answer that. There, there, there's no hard and fast question or rule for that. Um, but I'll give you the enough information to determine which um, to make an informed decision on how you want to go. I've been in groups where. Uh, and spoken with e-commerce people that have never done third-party uh, platforms like eBay or Amazon. They started their own stores, they started driving their own traffic, and they're very comfortable and building multi-million dollar businesses that way. And I've met people that are the other way. I'm gonna just tell you, the grass is always greener on the other side. That's all. Uh, pick a lane and go for it. Uh, would you recommend cloud-based? Okay, so that's kind of what I just asked, uh, Red. Assuming a very low startup budget, what's the best option for getting started and selling online? Now, if you have very low startup, my opinion is marketplaces because with the the um, ability to get your products in front of a captive audience that already is there on eBay or Amazon or, or whatever, can accelerate your uh, uh, startup very quickly because you can know whether or not this product is going to sell in a week or two, you know, where and if you uh, and then there's not a whole lot of out of pocket expense for you. You know, you're not building this whole infrastructure or any of that stuff. I mean, even if you use something like a Shopify, you still got to get all the imagery together and, you know, you got to make sure all these parts work and you might have to hire somebody to develop your store, whatever. You know what I mean? So, uh, I mean, if all things being equal and I'm low on uh, startup capital, I think it's very easy to buy a few uh, test items and, and put them on eBay or Amazon. All right. Uh, better off using the existing platform, eBay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the reply. Didn't Amazon purchase Whole Foods? In Europe, home delivery of groceries have increased a lot. Yes, Amazon did purchase Whole Foods. They purchased Whole Foods two years before uh, this happened. Um, and I'm sure they were like, yay, 
I'm so glad we've done that, you know, because they got an opportunity to have these uh, uh, distribution sites for their food delivery in major cities, you know? So, yes. All right, cool. I'm going back over to the slides. We just got done doing the cloud-based stuff. All right. So let's talk about marketplaces. Marketplaces. And remember, my story is I started on marketplaces. So I have an affinity for marketplaces. I like them, you know? Um, all right. Uh, top three options for marketplaces are Amazon, eBay, and Etsy. Uh, and those of you saying Etsy is for um, handmade, not anymore. You can pretty much sell everything on Etsy these days, you know. Uh, and they're expanding their breadth of selection uh, as they go for it. All right. So some of the pros. Uh, quick startup turnkey. We just talked about that. The built-in audience, the familiar buying experience. People know exactly what they're going to get when they buy from these kind of platforms, and they know where the button is, where the description is, you know, how to contact the seller. All of that kind of stuff is is a a, a pro for them. Uh, the customers trust their marketplace. If I'm an eBay seller or eBay buyer, and I trust eBay, then I'm going to go there to find the things that I'm looking for. It's got low financial risk and upfront costs. Uh, the cons, it's highly competitive. That, that's the one thing. If you're selling something that everybody else is selling, it can be extremely competitive, right? Um, you don't own the customer and you're not supposed to. I say here, you cannot. You can build a list of customers, but you're not supposed to be building a list because these customers belong to those platforms, all right? Um, you have no control over the buyer experience when eBay or Amazon changes checkout or things like that. Yeah, you know, you, you have no control over that. So they're going to dictate what the experience is going to be. It's definitely much more costly than the other two solutions. And your store is always at risk of somebody else shutting you down for arbitrary reasons. I mean, that's happened. People have suffered. And uh, people have tried to skirt rules and gotten caught, you know? So that's one of the cons. So those are the three uh, different business models. And you can start with one or two. And uh, um, really make inroads. I would suggest you select one and manage and maintain and learn as much as you can about that first and then move into the other one. Okay, uh, I talked about the top three in each of these. Here's the list of them again. And, and uh, I wanna give you the industry secret number 4,080. When it comes to online traffic, all traffic is not the same and you need traffic to make sales. That's how we make sales is by driving traffic to our site, to our landing page, to our wares. Um, there are three types of traffic. There's paid traffic, earned traffic, and own traffic. Paid traffic is very obvious. You pay to advertise on sites like Google, Bing, Facebook, you know, Amazon has a product ads. So you can pay for that traffic to get your product in front of a select audience, right? Pretty simple, you get it. Earned traffic is when you put content together and that content in turn becomes something that people will view, interact with, engage with, and you can make sales from that by them becoming aware of your store shop and the products that you sell. Um, you know, Instagram Reels, uh, photo ads on uh, uh, photo uh, uh, posts on places like Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, all of that stuff. That is earned traffic. Most of social is earned traffic. And then, of course, the money, this is the, the big one, is the owned traffic. That's when people sign up or have purchased from you and you've gotten their information. Right. So that is where the best bang for the buck is. That's where the money is, 
it's in your list, right? So I'm gonna talk about how to extract that money from your list once you've driven the traffic, created a offer, people have taken your offer, and in exchange for your offer, they've given you some of their details so that you can reach out to them. So how do you make money with your list? Well, the easiest, most common way is you get leads, right? Leads come in to the top of the funnel, they convert and they become customers. So you have leads times conversions equals customers. If you want to make money, what do you do? You get more leads because more leads will equal more customers. Or, and this is an area where I really get down deep with a lot of my clients about is how about we don't need any more traffic. We're getting great amount of traffic, but the conversion rate is low. So if I'm converting at 3% and I want to increase my revenue by 25%, all I've got to do is get one more percent in conversion. If I go from 3% converting to 4% converting, the uh, revenue top line increases by 25%. So I think sometimes people are always talking about we need more traffic, we need more traffic, more leads, more leads, more leads. How about also at the same time when you want to move that lever for more money, better conversion rates, all right? So that means more leads, more customers. Better conversion rates, more customers. Let's move down. Now that we've got customers, right? So customers, the number of customers we have times the number of transactions times the, the average order value, right? Equals our, our revenue. Let's break that down a little bit. So if I've got customers and they shop with us two times a year, right? Let's go back to our old number. Let's say it's $20. They, the average customer spends $20 on average, right? They come to us and spend that $20 two times a year. The average revenue from that customer is $40. Keep it stupid simple, right? If I want to increase the amount that I'm getting in revenue, I can get more customers, of course, again, more traffic, more conversions, more customers. So I get more customers, I get more revenue, obviously. But more transactions also equals more revenue. So if I can get that customer that comes and shops with me two times a year, just to come shop with me one more time that year, I've turned the average customer value from $40 to $60, given me a 30% bump, 33% bump in my revenue. See that? You know, so we can't overlook all the triggers we are able or levers we are able to pull. More customers, more revenue, more transactions, more revenue. Now we got the $20 guy. We add the offer. If they do $25, they get the free shipping. And now they're coming to us you know, uh, and instead of spending the $20 two times a year, they're spending $25 two times a year. We've moved the money from $40 on average for the customer to $50 on average for that customer. You see how that works? What is that, a 20% increase? So these are the levers that you can pull uh, for your customer base. More customers, more revenue. More transactions, more revenue. Increase average dollar on sale, more revenue. Cool? All right, let's look at the bottom one, the, or the bottom part of this ladder that I will put back together for you in just a second. <laughs> All right, so um, revenue, which is the money that we get from the profits that we make on uh, I'm sorry, not not profits. The revenue is the, the top line money that we get for making our sales, right? So your revenue times your margins equals your profit. So if you bring in $100 in revenue, your margin is 50%, all 
are 50, then that means you get your profits are $50. $50 goes to the overhead and all that stuff. The other 50 becomes profit, right? So that's revenue times margins equals profits. If we are able to streamline our operations, we can get more profits. I mean, if when you reduce headcount, it, 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 it immediately goes to your profit. That's why the first thing co companies do when they're in financial trouble is they reduce headcount because that's going to relieve some of the strains on the profits, right? So when you can streamline your operation, not just by removing a headcount, but when you can automate things, right? When you can maybe outsource instead of insource because you don't need a full-time on this, we just only need maybe a part-time work or we can outsource it to a company. Those are things where you can streamline your operations and get more profits. You can elevate your brand. Let me just tell you right now, there is no special farm with no special cows that have Louis Vuitton on them. Louis Vuitton makes the same, uses the same cows that any cheap leather purse producer makes. Leather is leather, all right? So the deal is that people pay that money for that little LV on the bag because Louis Vuitton has elevated their brand to get people to pay more for the same dead cow flesh as they had for the cheap purse makers. Same thing. Same thing. You're not, it doesn't carry more per square inch. Nothing. There's nothing about a Louis Vuitton bag other than it's elevated the brand. So when you can get brand recognition and elevate your brand, you're able to command more profits from your products. And then finally, vendor relationships can equal better profits. It's like when I talk to my vendors and they tell me, hey, we're noticing certain things in the industry right now. This is really a hot a product right now. This is a hot color. People, I'll never forget, at one point we used to sell uh, breast cancer awareness stuff and, and we would sell these shoelaces and they were uh, a powder pink, right? Just regular powder pink. That used to be the color that would sell the best during uh, breast cancer awareness time. Um, and then the NFL, the football league got into the uh, game and they started using hot pink. So they had hot pink shoelaces and hot pink hats and all that when they were uh, getting into uh, uh, that awareness for breast cancer awareness. And all of a sudden there was a shift, a complete shift in one whole season of with how many pink shoelaces we would sell versus hot pink shoelaces, simply because of that shift. But my, my uh, 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 vendors and my relationship with them let me know. It's like, hey, John, you know, we're we're seeing that the hot pink is actually selling more these these months than it was last year versus the uh, powder pink. So vendor relationships can definitely help you uh, garner more profits. All right. So that's the conversion or the 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 ladder of conversion: more leads, more customers, better conversion rate, more customers, more customers, more revenue, more transactions, more revenue. Increase dollar average sale, more revenue. Streamline your operations, more profits. Elevating your brand, more profits. Vendor relationships, more profits. So these are the levers that you can pull to get your e-commerce business or really any business on track to getting greater revenue and profits. Okay, hopefully you guys are getting this. Um, I'm going to leave you one last you know insider secret if you haven't before now it's time you need to invest in video video is i mean come on how many times can you hear the words TikTok and not be like why what's what when am i going to make a video so it's not like i'm saying get on TikTok. i'm just saying that the uh the stickiness of video is here it's been here but it's really here now so it's time to invest in video, 90% of customers say videos help them in their buying decisions and conversion rates on landing pages with video increased by 80%. It's time to really think about the video. Um, 
Uh, and here's a couple of other things. 96% of consumers find video helpful when making their purchasing decisions. 79% of shoppers online would rather see a video to get information about a product than read the text on the page. So what does that mean? Make a video and just read your text. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, it's not that cut and dry, but it's pretty simple, right? <clears throat> and the right product video can increase conversions by over 80%. All right. Gonna ask you guys if you do not have an e commerce store, I've got something for you. Go to this. It's free training on how to build a store from scratch. It's ecomfromscratch.com. Go to ecomfromscratch.com. Will, you'll get trained by me on how to build a store in one hour and i go step by step you get the uh get to look over my shoulder as i do every step of this and build a woocommerce store um in one hour and everything you need you don't have to be a techie to do this you'll be amazed at how easy it is and literally an hour from the time you start you'll be ready to take orders if you got products so basically that is all I've got for you guys today. I hope this was uh, informative and um, I'll, I'll go back. If you got any questions, we got about five minutes. So go. <laughs> Tip on uh, how to market my book on tea on Amazon. My book is one of millions of books out there. Uh, you gotta buy some ads, you know, buy some ads. Drive traffic off of Amazon to your T book. Start finding uh, uh, groups in Facebook that are uh, interested in teas, you know, and get your op offers out there. You know, I mean, I love tea. You know, I'm a tea drinker. And if I, I know that uh, you are there and this book is about tea, I'll check it out. You know what I'm saying? But it's really just about you. Uh, finding other places where you're driving the traffic to your T book versus waiting on others to just find it. And that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to really start thinking about, uh, like I said, making you know some of those videos. How about some how tos about the T business? I don't know what it is. How to put? I don't know. I don't know. But you know, because you're the T expert, right? So <laughs> you can do things like that to really start driving uh, stuff to your product. What's the best way to market an e-commerce store or product? I think everything I just said to that last question are some of the best ways, right? There's no um, magic bullet, but I mean, buying traffic can be the best way because one thing about buying traffic is once you find something that's working, all you gotta do is put more money to it. So you test, 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 and then you run really hard. On top of that, the organic stuff that you can be doing is making videos. I showed you that video, of, uh, I don't know if you knew that was me, uh, about how to fold bandanas. I sold bandanas. People kept asking me, well, how do you fold a bandana like this hip hop star? I was like, oh, okay, well, I know how to do that. So I made a video on how to fold bandanas, put it out on YouTube, got over 10,000 sales from that one video. And it's not a great made video. I didn't spend a whole lot of money on anything. I made it in my basement and with a one megapixel camera. It was back in the day, but still, you know what I'm saying? And to, even to this day, I'm still getting a whole lot of sales from, well, I don't get sales anymore. I get looks and views, but I get paid for the looks and views because I'm out of the bandana business, but I still get ads that are run on that video. So that's the way you do that. Um, when starting out as an entrepreneur, is it better off using it? Oh, okay, we already answered that. Um, great to hear. All right, great, Martin. Fantastic, guys. All right, so yeah, I, I, just wanna, I wanna throw in a warning here. Be careful if you've never run ads before, start really low. Yeah, there's a big learning curve. Look at our pay-per-click events and posts if you're gonna go the Google route. Um, but I have a free recommendation. Facebook Marketplace. You can promote products in the Facebook Marketplace for free. You can also put a free shop on your Facebook page and sell right there. It takes credit cards and sends the money to your bank. 
but there's a fairly steep percentage, a little higher than a credit card. It's not that bad. All right. So anyway, free tip, Facebook marketplace, Facebook um, shop, free shop. And um, if you go the pay-per-click route, be careful. Um, Lookalike audiences are awesome. There's all kinds of stuff we can tell you about that. And we have in other live events, you should check them out on our Biz Sugar. It's the page about all the events is at blog dot bizsugar.com in the top right there's a tab that says biz sugar live webinars click on that tab and you can find all of them yes facebook marketplace and uh, so i want to close it up you can find john a lot of places he does video what's the name of the show watching amazon is it watching amazon you can find that on facebook on the Facebook, on the Small Business Trends page, and maybe mm -hmm. on John's page, maybe on Brent Leary's page. Um, he's also got that great group I told you about, the e-commerce group. Are there any requirements to get in that group, John? Can anybody join? Anybody can join. Okay, and the name of the group? Uh, the e-commerce group. So just search uh, for the e-commerce group, or you can go to the e-commerce group.org. Okay, super. All right. So I want to close this up by inviting everyone to all of our webinars. They happen on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month at noon central, put on by the Biz Sugar Mastermind community, which is free to join. Everyone is welcome to join. We have some exciting new little niche groups in there now that are really taking off. So if you only care about e-commerce, you can join just the e-commerce group and only see posts about e-commerce and not have to see anything else. Um, I recommend the network wall because that's where we announce stuff. But, but you can join a niche group only about your interest and just see stuff targeted just for what you care about. So I'd love to have you come in and, and do that. How to join is also on the blog at bitsugar.com. And that's kind of it. Oh, a, a little teaser. We're looking at having a big event in November on November 10th. Save that date. It's going to be really big. And we're going to have people come in that have been successful. So you can ask them questions about how it was to get started and how successful are they. And John is one of our, one of our presentations that will be probably more high level than this one was. And he'll also be, follow it with a panel of people he has taught to do this, who will share that it's working for them. So you know that this is the real deal. This is not one of those get rich quick things that are all over the internet all the time. This is really how you really make money, not overnight, unless you have a lot of money to spend on ads, but you can really make money even if you have no money to spend on ads. Thank you so much, John. Awesome, thanks guys, I appreciate you. It's been fun. Bye-bye, everyone.